thousand miles and then back home to show the world how much you love them show them they are not alone our hearts long just to make this one thing I'm so glad that you joined us uh, in the room or you're watching online. And I love uh, just the band leading us in these songs. I love the vision behind that song that we just sang because it really just embodies so much of who we're trying to be as a community, which is this force for good in the world. We want to bring God's love to the people around us. We want to extend and expand the kingdom of God, and we want to do it together. And, and that's really the heart behind so many of the things that we do, right? It's why we're doing life group signups and, and we, why we walk in community together in those groups. It's, it's really why we're doing this series out of the shallows, why we're trying to grow deeper together. It's the heart behind why we, uh, we do things like gather and making that a priority or singing these songs that remind us who God is and, and who he wants to be in our lives. 
And so with that in mind, let's sing some more songs right now and, and not only be mindful of, of who God wants to be uh, for us and who we get to be called to be as individuals, but, but who we get to be and how we get to show up together. So let's sing that together. There is a fountain that drowns sorrows. There is an ocean deeper than fear. The tide is rising, rising. There is a current stirring deep inside. It's overflowing from the heart of God. The flood of heaven crushing over us. The tide is rising.
what your mess is for Nothing but kindness is all that you've shown I call for you, Father, call me your own When I have wandered, welcome out with me as we pray together. Oh Lord, we want to give you praise and thanks because we never have to guess when it comes to you, God. We never have to wonder whether or not you're going to accept us, uh, whether or not you're going to love us, um, wh whether or not you're going to, uh, to, to, uh, to engage us and embrace us, Lord. We, we know that in all those cases, God, your word to us is always yes. It's always yes. You've got a wide open door for us to walk on through and, and to be a part of your family, be a part of your community, to be a part of your movement. And, and so, Lord, uh, for each one of us today, God, whether we're here in person or online, is that we want to take a step towards you. Uh, God, take a step towards you and, and just knowing that, uh, that that's always the right step. And it's always welcome and it's always encouraged. Uh, Lord, we're just thankful uh, that, God, as we take that step, that you're going to meet us and you're going to move us forward, God, to be the people that you've created us to be. And so we're just believing that our time together today is going to help us in that end. And so we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, well, welcome to Terra Nova. My name is Lyle. So glad to have you all here. If you're here uh, with us uh, in the room, you can go ahead and have a seat. If you're watching online, you can sit down too. If you're standing up, that's fine. Um, and that'll work out great. Uh, just really excited uh, to have everybody here. And what I would love to do is to spend uh, some time um, walking you through uh, for the in-person people what you got when you walked in here. We call it the weekend program. So why don't you go ahead and pull that out and you can go ahead and open it up. And, uh, and as you'll do, you'll see a, 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 some information about a number of things that are happening here at Turnover that I'll get into in just a moment. But what I'd love for us to begin with is uh, spending some time 
with this perforated tariff card that you have on the back called the Connect card. And uh, I'd love to uh, have you fold it in half like I'm doing and tear it off and go ahead and grab a pen. You can go ahead and fill this thing out and, uh, and get going on it. Uh, because here's the thing is that uh, we just would love to hear from everybody, whether it's your first time here or your second time or you've been with us multiple times. We just love to hear from everybody. And you can do that using the paper version that maybe you have in your hand. We've also got the Connect card online. You can go ahead and fill it out there if you're watching online. And we also have that Connect card on your phone on the app if you got the app. And that uh, is uh, something that a lot of people really prefer. So anyway, we'd love to have you uh, spend some time working on this throughout the course of our time. And then we'll get this from you. And, uh, and, and that'll be great. Now, as you uh, are spending a little bit of time on that while you're opening up the program, you'll notice that uh, we've got a, a number of different things that I think uh, are... Uh, things that really help us uh, get our arms around what Terra Nova is all about. So this blue sheet, uh, we've got uh, it just uh, uh, some information about, um, about baptism. That's coming up, and uh, that's something that's really important. Uh, also this weekend, we've got the Terra Nova tour that's happening. Um, so the tour is a great way for you to find out what we're all about. Uh, at the tour, you're going to uh, find out about a number of different things. And by the way, if you haven't signed up for the tour, is that you can still go ahead and walk on. Just show up here at Terra Nova at 1230, and uh, we'll be uh, good to go and getting you all set up. But at the tour, you're going to find out about a number of different things, especially uh, what we call incarnation, and that is our movement to make God's love famous um, here in our community, uh, to really show God's love in ways that are tangible and practical. And we got a couple of different ways that we do that. One is we've got the Serve Day at the Abbey that's coming up. Uh, that's happening in a couple of weeks. We'd love to uh, have you join us uh, with that. There's information about that in your program. You can just go ahead and write the Abbey on your Connect card. We'll get you in play, or you can find it on the app as well. A great way to spend a Saturday morning. And then, uh, and, and then you may have noticed that if you're here in person walking into the lobby, so there's some of these big blue barrels that are in the lobby that, uh, that tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing called, called Healthy Homes. And Healthy Homes is, uh, is a, uh, a movement that's focused on uh, our single parent uh, families that are in our community and throughout our county. Uh, and, uh, and it's this simple strategic thing that we're doing by being able to provide cleaning supplies for single family homes uh, uh, during this time of the year um, so, because our end game is to keep uh, families healthy um, so that uh, everything works right. Now, unfortunately, that there's a ball that can kind of roll downhill in a bad way uh, for a single parent uh, family where if uh, a mom gets sick or a dad gets sick or the kids get sick and then you, you got to uh, uh, stay home from work and that becomes a problem, you might lose your job and then you might actually lose your place of residence because of that. Uh, so, so we want to stand against that chain reaction by just providing uh, cleaning supplies and helping uh, people out in just a real simple and strategic way. So you can, uh, on the flyer, uh, see the different items that we're looking for. And we encourage you to bring those back here uh, next weekend or throughout the week at the Hub. And you can participate in helping us uh, just really loving in a, in a very special and profound way uh, these uh, single parents that we care about uh, so much. And that'll be great. So, so again, it's just how we roll here at Turnova, and how we're rolling is gathering, being together, whether you're here in person or online, is that we just really believe that that is uh, uh, really important. And so just really glad that uh, you've chosen to join us. And so now let's go ahead and jump into part three of the series that we've been in, uh, the, the series that's been a great one uh, that we're doing, and it's called Out of the Shell. It's part three.
uh, you probably know this, or maybe have discovered this the hard way, that there are certain things you really should not try to do alone. Uh, you, you ever discovered something that fits in that category, maybe, maybe when it was a little too late, and you're thinking, I got this, I got this, I don't need nobody, I don't need no help, I can do this alone, and then you realize, uh-oh, I, I don't got this. Like, little help, I need some help. So maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it was like you had this way up high place to reach on your house, and your ladder wasn't long enough, so you decided to put the ladder on top of a table, on top of a table, but like, you got this. You don't need no spot. You don't need nobody like holding the ladder for you, because what could possibly ever go wrong with that? Did not see that coming, did you? Did not see that coming. And there's certain things it's like, yeah, you shouldn't try to do that alone. Or maybe you shouldn't try to do that at all. Or maybe uh, you're moving something really heavy, like from a third story downstairs, like a really big old-fashioned TV. And you don't need no help. You're just going to wrap it in a tarp and oh lower God. it over the <laughs> side. I got this. Uh-oh. I don't got this. I don't have this. Or uh, like weightlifting is often something you probably shouldn't try to do alone. So a tough guy here is going to videotape himself benching a personal best. And you know, weightlifters, when you're doing a PB, you don't need no spot. Like that's for girls. Like you don't need that. I got this. I got this. Have you ever been in this position? Some of you weightlifters have. Like I don't got this. I don't, I don't got this. And, and then right when he thinks he still has his man card... Mom, Mom. mommy, <laughs> mommy, so, like, there's just certain things like that you really should not try, try to do alone. Honestly, I think there are probably a lot of things that fit in that category. A lot of things that we probably should not try to do alone, and yet we do, or at least we try to do them in isolation or alone all the time. I mean, maybe it's our pride or hubris or ego, or maybe it's just like our self-destructive, self-sabotaging will, like I want to do what I want to do, and I don't want anybody like challenging me and questioning whether or not it's super smart to put a ladder on top of the table, on top of the table, because I just want to do that, right? And, and by the way, just a side note, in a couple weeks, we're kicking off a, a new series, a short series called How Not to Be Your Own worst enemy. And this is a series for everybody because we've all been our own worst enemy at some time or another, but, but it's times, especially times like this when we really can be our own worst enemy. And you might not know some people in your life who are their own worst enemy often, and you should invite them to this series. I mean, you don't even have to tell them what it is, but like, hey, you should come. It's for somebody else, not you. Bribe them, get them here, invite them. Uh, it's going to be a really helpful series, a three-week series. And just kicking it off, just so you know, kicking it off uh, uh, this series on Saturday night, February 5th, we're having a snow day right here. It turns out it's in conjunction with the Winter Olympics. Now, I, th I, don't th I think that's coincidental. I don't think they knew about this when they scheduled that. But uh, snow day, February 5th, 15 tons of snow, sledding hill. A uh, hot cocoa bar. It's going to be a lot of fun only on Saturday night during our 5 p.m. service, right before and after it. And so, if you got some families in your life, you have kids, or you got grandkids, or you got friends, and like neighbors who have kids, like this would be a great series and a great night to invite them with. It's really going to be great. But back to what we were talking about, I think there are whole areas of life that we should not try to handle in isolation. And faith is actually in that category. Faith is in that category, something you shouldn't try to do alone, and in fact, something you can't actually do alone if you want to get deeper. And so today we are in part three of our series, Out of the Shallows. It's a series about getting out of the shallows and going deeper in our faith, which we've defined in this series as gutsy, gritty, grounded in real life, confidence in God, confidence and trust and reliance upon God that he is with me, he is for me. It's the kind of confidence that begins to overcome fear in my life, that feels gutsy, uh, 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 that feels great love and enables gutsy obedience. And this is the kind of thing we said in week one that just made Jesus go, whoa. When Jesus saw this, he found that to be amazing, that kind of faith. And that's what this series is about, going deeper in our faith from wherever we are on the spiritual spectrum, if you will, whether you're kind of like spiritually 
trying to figure things out. Maybe you're skeptical about some things. You're wondering what you believe all the way to seasoned veteran taking that, taking next steps, never stopping, going deeper so that our faith would become more powerful and transformative to us and more compelling and helpful to other people around us. Now, one of the pushbacks that we might just instinctively have to this is, well, that's church's job. Like, John, that's your job or that's the professional's job. But we discovered last week that we all individually have a big part to play. And until we do, we'll actually be getting in the way. And, and, and there will be no more, uh, no more like content that could be fed to us. No more amount of sermons and books and podcasts and studies that will get us deeper because we have a role to play that we're not playing it. And last week, last week we said this, that the shallows can be bottle fed, but the depths have to be self fed. The, bow, bow, uh, the shallows can be bottle fed, but the depths must be self fed. Milk is, is perfectly uh, healthy for a human in their early stages of physical development. I mean, it's, it's perfect, right? But eventually, if you're going to become a healthy, growing, mature adult human, you got to put down the bottle and pick up a fork. And the same is true spiritually. Spiritually mature people are self feeders. And so we talked about this, this, this spiritual practice or this spiritual habit, if you will, that, that w- which through constant use, we talk, it was a constant habit. We can train ourselves. And, and we've, we referred to this spiritual practice uh, called daily prayer and reflection on scripture, sometimes called having your own private devotions or your own daily quiet time. It, this is what that's talking about. If you ever heard people talk about that, it's like getting alone daily, building this rhythm, this habit, this practice in my life through constant use of quiet prayer, eliminating distractions, put the phone somewhere else, turn the, you know, the music, the TV, everything off, quiet prayer and reflection on scripture. And I can think of no better place to begin that practice or to begin reading and reflecting on scripture than soaking ourselves in the life of Jesus, in the stories of the life of Jesus. And so we actually gave you a starter plan. Like here's a starter menu for you, uh, a, a reading plan uh, through the life of Jesus as told by Mark. And we actually stuck this in, your, in the physical programs again this week, just in case you missed it. And there are a bunch outside on the tables as you head out uh, and and here's the idea that you begin to get alone and, re- and begin reading and reflecting on scripture for yourself. And this plan will take you, take us all uh, through Easter, which is just perfect. And we're actually going to be starting a series on Mark's story of the life of Jesus this spring. So all of that just kind of fits together. But then we ended last week with what I think is an important disclaimer. We ended last week saying the truth is spiritual formation And by this, I mean like the kind that actually makes you a better human, like the kind of the kind of formation that makes you truly, truly deeper, better, more loving, a more authentic person. It only takes place dot, dot, dot. And that's where we pick up today, because when it comes to faith, we is greater than me. When it comes to faith, we is stronger than me. When it comes to faith, we is, is, uh, is better than me. And there might be, a, frankly, a lot of good reasons why you might recoil at that thought. Maybe it's just your personality. You're a little more introverted, which means like you're less inclined to invite everybody in the world into what you're thinking and what you're, how your life is going. It's just, that's just not how you instinctively roll. Or maybe there's tradition, like you grew up in a family uh, uh, or background where God, faith, religion, that was a private thing. That was not something that was discussed. It was personal, it was private, or your church background or religious background that you grew up in emphasized the personal individual relationship with God really to the exclusion of the collective experience. Or maybe it's a cultural deal where like how you were raised or the culture that you're from, men don't need people. Or strong women are self-sufficient. Like strong people don't show weakness. Strong people don't need help. It's the John Wayne or Susan B. Anthony, you know, I am woman, hear me roar. Like whatever that means for you, that rugged individual self-sufficient kind of thing. And all of these can be really subconscious 
uh, reactions to this whole idea that we might be greater than me. But listen, whether it's personality or your tradition, nothing wrong with tradition or your culture, if it's keeping you from going deeper, I mean, if it's holding you back, it would probably be a good idea to question and challenge that a little bit, don't you think? Because when it comes to growing deeper, alone will only get you so far. When it comes to growing deeper, alone will only get us so far. There are certain things that happen as a we that can't happen, and in fact, in many of these cases, actually don't happen the same as me. Now, to get at this, we're gonna go back to a letter that we started talking about or introduced last week. It's known as the letter to the Hebrews. It's written to Jewish background, Jesus followers, and we don't actually know who wrote this particular letter, but we're pretty sure why it was written. It's written sometime in the 60s, that is the original 60s, the 0060s, and, and the Roman emperor Nero has launched a vicious persecution against Christians in Rome where these followers of Jesus most likely live. And Peter, St. Peter, you've heard of him, Paul, these great heroes of the faith have already been killed and many, many, many others. Many followers of Jesus are being brutally murdered in this city for being Christians. And at the same time, it's especially difficult for Jewish background followers of Jesus because not only is the Roman world turning against them, but their mother faith, Judaism, and the synagogues at this point in history are starting to turn against followers of Jesus as well as are starting to push them out of the synagogues and actually publicly exposing them, like turning them into the authorities as Christians. And this community, and you can just imagine like how that would feel if that's happening all around you, they are tempted to shrink back. They are tempted to take a big step back. And maybe, maybe you can relate because maybe that's what the last couple of years have been like for you. You've actually taken some steps backward in your spiritual journey. And this writer who knows them really well and loves them, he's writing to just urge them forward, to urge them towards endurance and towards grit and resilience to go all in, don't fold, double down to actually go deeper and not just personally and individually, but as a community, as a collective, like for one another do this. And there's a sense of mutual responsibility, a linking of arms that, that just fills this letter. It's like, don't just do this for yourself. Do it for the person sitting next to you. Do it for the person who's coming behind you. Do it for the person who hasn't started, even started on the journey yet. We are in this together. And so Hebrews 10 actually forms a hinge in the letter, if you will, a turning point in the letter. And what he says here is just packed with insight about what it takes to actually go deeper. And he begins by quickly summarizing his point that he's been making up till now. And he's been saying something that's really powerful, especially for Jewish background followers of Jesus, because he's describing so much of their story and experience. And he's been saying something that they all would, would acknowledge is true, that the sacrifices in the temple never really cleansed us. And he's talking to people who know that feeling. They've all physically been to the temple. They've had families and extended families who've showed up to the temple for years and they've offered the sacrifices themselves and they've watched the high priest go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. They've been a part of that experientially and they know like, yeah, the, the sacrifices that we do, it covers over our guilt, but it doesn't really fully and finally remove it. It doesn't take it away and it doesn't actually seem to change us or transform us. And therefore, we have never really been free to come as we are to draw near to God as he really is being who we really are. There's always been a barrier. There's always this barrier, which is symbolized in, the, in, in the, the most holy place itself. This holy place where no one could enter but one person, only the high priest, and then only on one day of the year, the day of atonement, and then only after going through extenuous steps to purify themselves and the great curtain that separated that from everyone else. And he's saying, there's always been this barrier, but Jesus, who he calls our great high priest, he's our high priest who loves us and who can actually relate to us in our struggles, has completely fulfilled God's will, has perfectly and completely fulfilled God's will for 
us. He has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. And therefore, he makes the point that he has completely removed guilt. He has completely removed shame. There is no more barrier. And so he's kind of pulling that together before he turns the corner and he says, therefore, therefore, since I've been like all that I've been saying, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter, imagine this, we can actually, all of us, enter the most holy place, that place where God's presence is most real by the blood that is the, the, the life sacrificed by Jesus and by a new and living way that is opened up for us through the curtain, through the curtain into the holy place that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, since, since, and he's about to, to apply it, He's about to turn the corner into action. Since this is so true, therefore, here's what you gotta do. And, and I wanna read this next section. I'm just gonna read the whole thing. And I want you to listen and kind of try like follow carefully. And there's a phrase that gets repeated three times, three times through this next section. And I want to see if you can pick up what it is. You ready? You ready? Okay, so here I'm, gonna, here I'm going. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the the day approaching. Okay, did you catch it? Something that was said three times, what was it? You want to shout it out? Anybody take a guess? Let us. Let us. Let us. Not let me. Not let you. Not let them. Let us. Why let us? Well, quick aside, a little fun with grammar, okay? A little fun with grammar. Turn to the person you're sitting next to and say, grammar is fun. Go ahead, just do that. Just turn to them next. Grammar is fun. Fun with grammar. This letter, some of you might know this, uh, this letter, in fact, all of the documents that are found in what we call the New Testament are not written in modern English originally. They were written in ancient Greek. And there is a verb form in the Greek language called the hortatory subjunctive. Let me hear you say hortatory subjunctive, per perfect. And the hortatory subjunctive is actually a first person plural command form of a verb. Now, the English language only has second person command forms. You may probably have never thought of this because you didn't know that grammar was so much fun. But the English language really only has second person imperatives and commands. Every command in English has an implied you to it. You singular, you plural. It's like do this, go there, stop that. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to you. It's all second person. We don't have a way of commanding us to do something and we don't have a way of commanding them to do something. I mean, they're not even here. We can only command you, singular or plural, to do something. Greek actually has a way of creating a first person imperative, a way of saying, hey, do this, but to us, like we're going to do that. This is this is for all of us, and we're going to do it, and we're going to do it together. And the only way in English that we have to translate that is with this phrase, let us. Let us. Like, we're doing this, and we're doing it together, so come on, let's go. Let's go. And that's the mood that's actually have, being created throughout this entire letter, this sense of we. We, in fact... If you were to skim the letter to the Hebrews, and I encourage you to do this, don't even try to read it, just like scan, open up a physical Bible, okay, and scan page after page, you can do it in like two minutes, and just underline every single use of the word we or us, just, just ding it, you will be fascinated, it is, the letter is saturated with this is us, this is we, if we're going to do this, if we're going to make it through this, the only way to do this is we, is us, not you versus me, certainly not us versus them, it's us, it's we together, because faith is not just a me thing, it's a we thing, and as he turns the corner here in this letter, he's driving this home, specifically giving us three things that are in this let us 
category. Uh, three things that can happen as we that really don't happen in the same way as just me. And the first one he says is this, let us draw near to God with sincere heart in the full assurance of faith or the full assurance that faith brings. And the first thing he says that is a we and not just a me thing is that we draw near to God together. We draw near to God together. We were made to discover and experience and actually be transformed by God together and not just alone. In fact, our brains are wired this way. Our brains are actually wired that together experiences are more heightened and like more real and more meaningful than alone experience. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? I mean, we can have great experiences alone and then what's like the first thing you want to do? Share it with somebody else. And that's why God invented Instagram. So that we can take all of our alone experiences, look what I'm eating, and share it with hundreds and hundreds of our friends who can experience it and like it or dislike it with us because that, it like takes what we had alone, makes it a little bit more real. We has a way, sharing experiences has a way of intensifying that experience just in our brains in a way that does not happen when we're alone. Singing a great song to God is great alone, but being in a room full of people who are just singing it and experiencing it together is a heightened experience. Reading a verse by yourself is important. It's great processing it alone, but having some people who are processing that with you and leaning in and they're as into it as you are, it takes that experience to another level. We brings an intensity, another level to our experience of God. We draw near to God together in a way that we cannot do alone. But then he adds something to this that is so profound. He says, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And he's using familiar, and that means like familiar to them, totally not familiar to us. But again, it's written to Jewish background, followers of Jesus. And this has been part of their experience from infancy, this language from the temple of rituals of cleansing and forgiveness and purification is what he's been saying through this letter has been fully and finally accomplished for all of us through what Jesus has done. And this is so huge right here because one of the things that keeps us from drawing near to God is shame. One of the things that keeps us from drawing near to God is a sense of just maybe our own unworthiness, uh, our own maybe badness, if we would never use that word. It's like this sense of shame. And most of us have probably had the experience of maybe just stepping back from God even a little bit, or stepping back from, from community, or stepping back really from any significant endeavor of your life because there was a sense instinctively of unworthiness to actually take that next step. And we, get this, we can bring a sense of worthiness, of grace, of forgiveness, of lovableness to one another that me can never bring to myself. I can try to get on the cognitive left brain side of my shame and script myself with better truth and I can argue with my shameful lies, but shame, that sense of recoiling is a precognitive experience. You're having it before you're logically thinking about it and forgiveness and freedom, and love, and grace, and knowing that you are loved and acceptable, that must be experienced. It must be experienced with others, and your right brain experiences that in a grace-filled community in a way that can never just be logically handed to you. And here's the deal, we all have bad days. We all have bad patches, maybe bad seasons, and we sometimes need someone to come along or some someones who are in our life to remind us Hey, you're forgiven. That might be what you did or what you're struggling with. That's not who you are. You are loved. You, are, you belong. You are filled with God's grace. You are cleansed. You are pure. And, and we need a community of people who communicates that to us, who gives that to us, who does that with us. And one of the things you can do to grow deeper in your faith is to surround yourself 
with some people who are drawing near to God with sincere hearts. This idea of just being authentic and genuine and real and full assurance of faith. And they can surround you with that faith when you don't have it for yourself. And the reverse is true as well, that one of the greatest things that you can do for others is to be a part of a community like that for them and to surround them with that same faith. Faith, He says, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near to God with sincere hearts, full assurance of faith. And then the second thing he says is, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. The second thing we do together in a way that we cannot do it alone is we hold on to hope together. We hold on to hope together because there are things There are things that are coming your way. You don't know what they are yet, but they are gonna make you want to swerve in your hope. It's like you're driving down the highway of life and it's like you're filled with hope and the sun is high and the wind is at your back and you know, daddy's rich and mama's good looking. It's like everything's going my way and something falls in your lane right in front of you. Like suddenly there's instability in your job. Or suddenly you didn't see it coming and she breaks up with you and you're devastated. Or or someone you love gets a diagnosis that rocks your world. Or you just run into one of many life's instabilities. Infertility, job loss, divorce, death of a loved one, broken friendship, an estranged or prodigal child. Or maybe it was just 2020. Like 2020 landed in your lane and you not only swerved, you ran into a ditch. Like your hope just went Uh, out the window, if you will, and when whatever lands in your lane, and it's when, not if, when that lands in your lane, you are going to be tempted to swerve. And when that happens, I hope you have a we around you who will help you hold on to hope, who will remind you that God is faithful, that he is not surprised or shaken by this, that he is with you and for you. I hope you have a we that will help you hold unswervingly, who will remind you to hold on, but better than that, who will actually hold on to faith with you, and if need be, will actually hold on to faith, hold on to hope for you on your behalf because valleys, like dark valleys, valleys of the shadow of death kind of valleys, they're just part of the terrain. They're part of everyone's journey. And isn't it true that valleys can be the place of our greatest growth, like those seasons in life when we got deepest? And isn't it true that valleys can be the place where we lose all hope and we lose all faith and abandon it altogether? And that's why God wants you to have a we in your valleys, and why he wants you to be a we in the valleys of other people around you because we hold on to hope together. Let us, he says, let us, let us draw near to God. Let us hold unswervingly to hope. And then third thing he says is let us consider how we may spur one another on. I love that, spur one another on to love and to good deeds. Let's consider, like, let's put some thought into this. Let's give serious consideration to how we can provoke and fire up and spur one another on to be more loving and more generous and better human beings. The third thing that that happens with we that does not happen in the same way as me, is that we stay fired up together. We keep each other hot together. It's kind of like coals in a fire, like we contain heat. We keep each other glowing and hot together. And you know what happens if you pull just one coal, just one, off of the fire and set it by itself away from the fire? You know what happens to that coal? It gets cold gets cold, loses heat, and it does so quickly. It's surprisingly how quickly that coal just loses its heat. You put it back on the fire and it sparks right up. And that's us. That's who, that, that's, that's what human beings are like. And we need a we to stay on point. We need a we to, to keep us on fire, to spur us on, and to specifically to spur us on toward love and good deeds because that does not seem to be, be a natural thing we move towards. We need a we that will help us actually be God's good news in the world around us. Character, as it turns out, and there's a lot of research on this, character is formed through group identity. Our character, that is, who we are before we have a chance to think about it, who we are reactively before we actually have a chance to process it, 
It's actually formed through our sense of attachments and our sense of tribe of people like us. People like us do things like this. This is how I'm supposed to behave because people like us do things like this. And your brain, and specifically your right brain, a lot of research been done on this recently, your right brain is actually wired this way to define yourself in relation to your attachments and your tribe, and your people, that's how character is formed, and that's actually how character is transformed as, uh, through, through community. So here's what that means. Whatever your tribe is that you kind of relate to and, and identify yourself and surround yourself with, that's what you're going to be spurred on to. And you know that's true. Whatever your tribe is spurred onto, that's what you're going to be spurred onto. That's what's going to shape in, be shaped in you. And if you will surround yourself with a community of people who are drawn near to God and they're holding on to hope together and they are committed to love and to good deeds, to be in the good news of God right smack dab in the middle of the world, it will inspire you and it will spur you on in the same way. See, the truth is, Spiritual formation, you know, the kind that actually makes you truly deeper and better and a more loving and a more authentic person, it only takes place, only takes place in community. It's not a theological thing, it's a physiological thing. It's actually how your brain was wired to be transformed drawing near to God together, holding on to hope together, spurring one another on, keeping each other fired up together. When it comes to growing deeper in your faith, we is greater than me. There are depths that can only be accessed, depths of character transformation, depths of understanding the character of God that can only be accessed through community, through genuine, authentic, real community, you will never be, you will, you, will be, you will be able to go deeper as a we than you will ever be able to go alone. See, a deep faith, a deep faith is a faith that has friends. A deep faith is one that has friends. So here's my question. Do you have people like that? Do you, do you have people like that? Not do you have friends. I hope you have friends. Like, I, re, I hope you don't, like, I hope you have some people, like you have some friends, but that's not my question. Do you have friends like this? Do you have some people in your life like that who are close to you? And for many of us, honestly, our answer would probably be, I mean, maybe it's just straight up no, or maybe it's like, not really, or not always, or it's not really quite like that, especially over these past couple of years. It has been so easy and frankly, just straight up excusable to withdraw and not have people in my life. And so the writer of Hebrews ends by saying this. He says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. Why would you ever do that? And some have begun to pull away. Can you relate? Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but in fact, encouraging one another and all the more, all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, this isn't something, this, this is something to do more as you see the signs that things are headed towards the end. This is something to do more as time passes, not, let, not less. Don't give up on together. Don't forget, don't give up on being together. And some of us have. Some of us, some of us have. Maybe we were in community at one point in our lives and things just got busy and we gave up on it. Or maybe we were in community, we had that kind of community in one stage of our life. Like when I was in high school, man, I had just the greatest group of, of friends who were helping me follow Jesus. And then I got into college and it got complicated and I wasn't really gelling with who it was and I gave up on it. Or maybe I, have, I had that, I was in community and then COVID hit and I gave up on it. Or I tried community, I tried it, hey, it didn't meet my expectations. It didn't meet my hopes. There are people there who annoyed me. By the way, that's one of the ways we grow the most, through, difficult, like, through people who are pushing our buttons and we have to deal with our own stuff. Hate to say that, but it's true. I tried community, didn't really meet my expectations. I gave up. Or maybe for you, it's like, 
The truth is you've never really tried it at all. Not really because maybe it's like, well, I'm kind of shy. I'm a little introverted. Or maybe I have some social anxieties. And that's a real deal. I get that. It's just not my thing. Or maybe I think religion, I just believe religion is a private deal. I just believe like what I believe that's personal, it's for me. This whole we thing is not my thing. But the writers, <laughs> writer of Hebrews is like, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't give up on this. This is too important to be too busy to do. This is too important to be too proud to do. This is too important to be too superior to do. This is too important to be too discouraged to do. It's too important to be too advanced to do. Too important to be too shy to do. This is too important. Don't give up on together. It's how God wants to take you deeper. When it comes to a deeper faith, we is better than me. We is stronger than me. We is greater than me. Wherever you are on your spiritual spectrum, wherever you are on figuring out who God is or following him with your whole heart, you will discover more faster as you discover it with others. You will grow faster and deeper as you're growing with others, having a we around you that's drawing near to God with you with sincere hearts, being real about it, who is holding unswervingly to hope and full assurance of faith, who is spurring you on towards love and good deeds, spurring you on to be the kind of person you want to be. And remember, this isn't just about you. It's not just about you. It's about the person next to you. And it's about the person who's coming behind you. And it's about, the, about, it's about the person who hasn't even showed up yet. Don't deprive someone else of the benefit of journeying alongside you as you are doing these things yourself. Let none of us give up on meeting together, on having a we that is greater than me. Now, today I want to invite you to take a very practical step in this. And in fact, it's so practical. There are probably a lot of other ways, some profound ways to apply this in our lives. I'm going to give you one very practical way to apply this with two different parts. One practical way with two parts. January, as it turns out, happens to be one of three months of the year where we do signups for life groups. Happened three times a year, three life group signup months, and we are smack dab in the middle of one right now. And I want to challenge you, part one, to actually sign up for a life group. Just straight up challenge you to do that. Sign up for a life group. Life groups are our way of helping your faith find some friends. Life groups are our way of helping you get a we for you. And there is a brochure if you were handed a physical program that's in, in that program. There is a brochure that I would invite you to pull out and check out. If, you're, if you are a Terranova app user, this is on the app as well. If you're watching at home on your computer, there's a link on our homepage as well. And I want to I wanna actually, I'm going to give you a minute to actually do this. I'm going to give you a minute and just a minute and there's going to be some music playing to actually look through this and sign up for a group. You'll notice there are a lot of different kinds of groups. There are three different men's groups. There's sort of ones that are like an early morning group. There's an evening one. There's a Saturday one. I think there are four different women's groups at different times of the day and, and night. There's a, there's a starting point group right here on the first page. It'll be happening on Sunday mornings, 11 a.m. right here at, at Terra Nova. There's a starting point group that is just perfect for you to begin taking next steps in exactly what we've been talking about during this series. And that might be just the one you need to sign up for. There's a young adult group. There are a lot of groups that are actually just for everybody in every life stage, everywhere they're at in their spiritual journey to do it together because I, like, I have great value for that and, and we do as well. And so I'm going to give you a minute. And you've, if you haven't signed up for a group yet, my challenge for you to sign up for a group. Like that's just part one of a very practical step. And during this minute, if you have already signed up for a group, I want you to pray, not talk to the person next to you. Okay, so I want you to be praying like for other people who are maybe signing up or praying for the group that you have that you've signed up for that it would be this kind of group rather than taking this as a commercial break to talk to the person next to you. So to help you with this, because they're gonna wanna talk to you, I just wanna give you a, an excuse. Right now, turn to the person next to you and just say right now before it even starts, sorry, I can't talk, I'm gonna be praying. Just turn to them right now. Say, sorry, I can't talk, I'm gonna be praying. Because they're gonna start talking to you and you're like, we covered that, okay. So I want to ask you to actually spend some time during this, this minute that I'm going to give you and pray and, and sign up for a group. But that's only part one. Part two is show up for the group. Actually show up. And when I say that, I don't mean like go to the group. <laughs> of 
course you're going to go to the group. You're not going to sign up for a group and not go to it. That's not what I mean. I mean show up. You know what I'm saying? I mean really show up your sincere heart, your real self, like bring who you really are to that group, however bad your day is or however tired you are, like bring your real authentic self to that group. It's the only way transformation really happens. In fact, we have a value at Terra Nova we call our participative community value. And part of that value reads like this. That's a lot of words. Here it says, it says, it is in the context of committed, authentic community, and then it gives an explanation. Each person bringing their gifts, their abilities, their questions, their doubts, learnings, insights, resources, that the Spirit's power to actually transform lives is dramatically unleashed, and love becomes the rule. Old wounds finally begin to heal. Offenders find forgiveness, and true conversion, true change actually becomes a reality. Now, I love, I love the vibe of that. I love what it does to me as I read that, but did you catch the part right there in the middle? Because this is really critical. Each person bringing their strengths and their weaknesses, their answers and their questions, their learnings and their doubts. In other words, their real stuff. Like I was reading this, man, I got a lot out of this, but this part, I don't know if I buy that. I don't know if I feel like that's even a good idea. If you're not, if your real self isn't showing up, the Spirit's power to transform lives is not unleashed. So sign up for sure. That's really important. But even more importantly, show up. Bring your real authentic self. A deep faith is one that has friends and I'd love for you to come out of this next season. And if someone says, do you have friends like that? Your answer would be, oh yeah. Oh yes, I do. I have these kinds of people in my life and I am so grateful. But it doesn't just happen. You have a part to play. So pull out the brochure or open up your app and here's a minute for you to actually do this. So we get the, uh, the beautiful opportunity to be on this journey of walking towards Jesus. And one of the things we recognize is that as we seek to do that, we do that together. And so just as we talked about, we've decided that we will be people who draw near to God, and we're going to do that together. We're going to be people who hold on to hope, especially when that's hard to do. But we will do it because we're doing it together. And we're going to be people who stayed fired up. We stay focused on this mission, on this life that Jesus has called us to do. And we don't have to do that on our own. We get to do that together. And so I hope that right now you're able to identify a group or two that you can jump into. If you're doing that on, on uh, the Terra Nova app or online on the website, all you have to do is click submit and you're done. And uh, if you're using this brochure, let me uh, walk you through that real quick. You've got the back side of this, a quick little form right here. And what you're going to do is fill it out. And then in just a moment, as we're winding down, we're going to head out and you'll find our guest services team members. They're going to be at the door and you're going to drop this brochure in that basket. And as you're doing that, there's a few other things that we can... Uh, can drop in there. One of the things is the Connect card that Lyle was mentioning to you about. And so uh, go ahead and fill that out. If you haven't left any uh, questions, prayer requests, comments, updates, then you can do that. You'll drop that off at the basket as well. And if you're part of the Terra Nova family and you want to utilize this offering envelope to give to support our mission to making God's love famous, you can drop this off in there as well. Or you can give online or using our Terra Nova app. Um, and so those are the things that we can kind of prep and get ready to go uh, as we're about to wind down. Uh, as we're doing that, I wanted to mention one thing that's actually coming up, and it's happening tomorrow, Sunday uh, at 1230. We've got what we call our Terra Nova Tour. And so that's something that we do a few times during the year. 
that kind of gives people an idea of who we are as a church community, what we're all about, some of our values and where we're headed. Uh, Some of you might be signed up for that. Others, you might go, you know what, that sounds like something I needed to get signed up for, so do I have to wait till next time? No, you can actually walk on. Again, that'll be tomorrow, Sunday, about 1230, right next door in our high school room. And so walk-ons are totally accepted for that. We got you uh, lunch and all that taken care of. And so that's happening tomorrow. But again, I want to invite you to come back next week for the finale of our series, Out of the Shallows. It's going to be part four, so don't miss that. We hope to see you all back next week for that. God bless you all.